the books. Hey, hey, it's time for book reviews. Hello everyone and welcome to Fogmonster's vlog for the Warhammer for the Passing Gaming System. Created by Games Workshop based in the UK. And welcome to book review number 74 of this vlog. Today I'm going to be reviewing the novel The Nation of Pythos written by David Annandale. Uh, in, the, in, the, in the latest couple of uh, book reviews there has been a, a kind of theme with the Shattered Legions stories during the Horus Heresy setting. And I'm going to continue it in this re book review as well. And in the reviews that comes after this there will be a the thematical week that you can expect and enjoy. But I will get back to that later on as, as we progress. So we can begin to talk about the front cover for this uh, full novel. The front cover shows us the ragtag teams consisting mostly of the Iron Hands, but also remnants of Ravenguard and Salamanders, as they are fighting off warp-infused monsters on the planet of Pyphos in the Pandorax system. It more or less tell us, tells us what to expect of the story. The Iron Hand you can see look very nicely done, but the giant monster looks a bit cartoonish. I would give this front cover 6 out of 10 forks. Let's see what this is all about. The Damnation of Pythos. In the aftermath of the Dropsite Massacre at Isvan 5, a battered and blooded force of Iron Hands, Raven Guard, and Salamanders regroups on a seemingly insignificant. Insignific insignific I can't even pronounce it. Death World. Fending off the attacks from all manner of monstrous creatures. The fractitious allies find hope in the form of a human refugees fleeing from the growing war and cast adrift upon the tides of the warp. But even as the space marines carve out a sanctuary in the jungles of Pyphos, a darkness gathers that threatens to consume them all. So following from this short underdrama called Veritas Ferrum, the survivors of the 111th clan company of the Iron Hands drops out in the Pandoric system, relatively close to the planet of Pyphos. Returning are some of the main characters from the previous short story by the name of Captain Durham Atticus and Sergeant Anton Galba. Py Pyphos seems to be a strong gathering point for warp activity, but since they are cut off from outside the system, they decide to make planet fall on this uh, the strange planet. Amongst the survivors, there's also a few uh, survivors from the Salamanders and Ravenguard Legions. Even though it could be considered a Shattered Legion story, I think essentially it's an Iron Hands novel with elements from the other two legions. On the planet, they come across uh, some local animals by the name of Sarians, who the Ravenguard character by the name of Inacus Petero recognizes as herbivore usually, but they come under attack from these creatures and they realize that they have in instead developed and evolved into carnivores instead. It leaves them with a couple of casualties during the first attack, but they don't know the source to all of this, what it is. The reader obviously knows that the source is the warp and powers from the materium, which has tainted these animals and made them hostile. They, inter they interrupt their planet investigation uh, as they read anomalies from the, uh, are expected to arrive from the warp. They then make the accurate guesses that they are in fact Emperor's children ships that's coming in into the system, which gives them certain uh, plans for their arrival. It's a smaller fleet of Emperor's children ships that arrive into the system and they are caught right inside an ambush. The Shattered Legion's force boards their capital ship and set it, sets it on a journey to destruction. Shortly after their victory, many junkyards of ships arrive into the system and the Shattered Legion's members realize that they are in fact human-based ships which barely shouldn't have made it through the, the trip in, inside the warp. These sh human settlers land on the planet and start to, to set up a smaller camp. It would be proved to be a fatal mistake considering as the warp carnivores, Saurians, begin to attack their settlement. The Iron Hands character Atticus then decides it's up, it's up to the humans to prove if they will survive or not because the flesh is weak. But the Salamanders character of the, by the name of Kidem says that it's their duty to save all human citizens inside the Imperium. 
and I must admit that I haven't been a big fan of the salamanders in their past as they often come across as the angry human rights activists who think they are better than everyone else without seeing the bigger picture. Me as a reader suspected that these settlers would be corrupted from the beginning based upon how their, their, ob their very obvious behavior. They openly worship things, uh, something that is not openly stated, and they are over overly vague about everything that they, they, they do. The Iron Hands, on the other hand, soon decide that they will help these settlers, and uh, it goes well with, uh, with the exception of a few casualties, and the humans manage to set up a, a workable camp. The Iron Hands serfs are then set to help them and interact with these uh, human settlers. Here we follow a small subplot line through the eyes of the characters of uh, Jeroen, Kanchel and Agnes Tanara as they try to stay faithful to their emperor whom they have begun to worship as a god but also try and stay sane in the odds again, uh, which is the, uh, stacked against them. Many of their friends have uh, co committed murder and suicide during the story's progression because they go insane. There's a fantastic scene actually where we follow Jeroen as he's invited to the settler's sermons as he is slowly tempted to join them uh, and feels so seductive to follow but he stops at the last moments and leaves the tent. Uh, my, my biggest problem is that I can't really connect to these humans however. In the previous horror series stories we have, uh, have worked out excellent in a way that because the humans work in a way to counterpart the superhumans with a mortal human perspective. It worked mostly because we, fo we followed their development from rational, logical characters who slowly turn to faith in order to survive. Here we are thrown directly into their faith and I just had a hard time to relate to them as they didn't balance off good with the Iron Hands. Like for instance, if you have the Iron Hands perspective of things and then you have the human perspective of things and then they try to clash and they try to re reason with each other and then work out a solution. That's what I like about these combos. But if you have iron hands that don't see eye to eye and you have just stu uh, humans you can't relate and then they can't mix. Uh, it's not a good mix there. The iron hands soon however realize that uh, everything isn't as it appears to be and they find the spot which is the source of everything. Their ship, the Veritas Ferrum, fires upon this location but the force of the last beams are then returned back to it and destroys what's left of the ship. The loyalists, the loyalists are now stranded and they realize that the settlers are in fact the enemy. They, they, they devise a plan to strike back at them and Galba and his men are then tasked with attacking the only named characters of the settlers which is the characters from the Sermon of Exodus short which I reviewed in my previous video. They reveal themselves to be Devonite cultists and they are gunned down by the Iron Hands. The character of C-Rect, which then returns from the sh uh, short story Exodus, Sermon of Exodus, is turned into some kind of demon priest of the Chaos Undivided called Madile. He then kills all of the Iron Hands sent out to kill him, including that of Galba. So this is a very strange decision on David Annandale's uh, part, I would say, as Galba is one of the few point of view characters we have that we share a lot of time with, so why would you kill him off three-fourth into the story. Why wouldn't you save him to the end? Thematically, it would make more sense if Kidem would have been killed off as he is the stupid character who wanted to save these human settlers in the first place. Considering that he is one of the few characters other than Atticus and Galba that's developed that much, it makes no sense to keep the smaller characters alive for a longer time of period. Like, most of the smaller Iron Hands characters are only mentioned when they're being killed off. So they are mostly used as red shirts. The only red shirt character that works around with all this is when a contemptor dreadnought by the name of Abtrax says that he will sacrifice himself to give them under the other people time. And, my, I, and I personally is actually touched by this moment. Even though it's the first time that he is mentioned in the story. In the end, the smaller characters of Daras takes over the role of Galba out of nowhere. Kidem then sacrifices himself also in this end, but, but it's to no satisfactory means because I dislike the character so much and it was just a repetition of what Atrax has done earlier in the story. Like, first Atrax is like, 
oh, I'm gonna sacrifice myself so you can uh, sa give you Alder some time, then he's dead. And then Kidem is like, I'm gonna sacrifice myself to give you some people some more time. It lessens the thing if you do it twice in a row. It's not heroic considering that he is the one who put them in the mess in the first place. So then all the remaining characters are slaughtered and as they try and buy time for the astropath so she can touch this tower that the settlers have built at the center of all this. Madile is then almost killed at like a last boss in a game with one weak small spot which is found by Atticus. The astropath managed to send away the message back to Terra and the last surviving human surf can rest assured that Terra is warned at last. It ends with the human surf of Yerun being carried away by the demons and the message is then completely ignored on Terra. So, if you would ask me, I think that this could have been a message that which spoke of the betrayal at Istvan 5, which we saw in the Outcast Dead, connecting this story more to the overall narrative. So it means that the things that they did weren't just in vain. But nope, it would simply have to re react all efforts of what these characters have done into nothing. Ignoring this novel would have no bigger impact on the overall storyline. It affects nothing as it's so self-contained that an all characters die. It doesn't connect to any other stories for it, with the exception of two short stories and it lacks any type, any type of antagonist that you can touch and feel. Making the planet itself as the antagonist is very abstract and hard for a reader to get its hands around. If you were to ignore this novel, you wouldn't miss out anything. The only saving grace in this novel is two scenes which I mentioned. The first is with Yorun being tempted and the other one about Agra's sacrificing himself. And despite all this, I like how it is written in the way that sentences are built up. I don't like the overall plot, unlike most of Nick Kime's stories, because those are dreadful just to read, it doesn't matter even what kind of content it has. This, this novel is in fact, this could be considered as the battle for the abyss in the third phase of this series. So I see a lot of issues with the story personally. What I would have done instead is to improve it as, is as following. When the Iron Hands come out of the warp into the Pandoric system, they would find the Emperor's children already there. Then I would have established and developed the East Emperor's children's characters as they are at this moment the arch enemies of the Iron Hands. So they are nemesis to each other. Thematically, it would be two legions who hate each other who finally get a kind of confrontation. Make it character, make it a character that they know of already, that they've served together with in the past. Develop him as a good antagonist. Then you would go all, all into each other with it, and it would cripple both ships as they then would later on crash land on Pyphos. It could even be that the Shatter's Legion sends out uses drop pods. And by this point you have already established that they are stuck on a planet with no way of getting out. It would be a question of survival. Much of the equipment and tanks and such would uh, survive and they would let out a smaller scout party go ahead and, and they would find these Saurians and they would find that oh they become carnivores instead of herbivores. And then further into the story they would come across the settlers which, uh, who, is, who are already established on the planet but they are not well equipped to survive for any longer uh, as the Saurians is coming to attack them as well. The Salamander is then still an idiot who su suggests that they try and help them out but the character of Atticus still wants to find the source for the warp anonymously. So Atticus divides the, their forces into two. Galba and the Salamanders stay put in the human settlers and Atticus and the Raven Guard move forward to the warp anonymously. Anomaly. So and at the source they find the, the damnation catch and instantly it connects to the Pandorax novel which was written by CJ Dunn I believe. And they also find that the other, the, a few of the Emperor's Children characters have survived their crash, the main antagonist included. After the demon ascension of uh, Fulgrim, th this will take place after Angel Exterminatus, 
the songs of the cache would have brought the emperor children there and he, want, he would want to ascend in the same way as his uh, primarch did by opening up a warp rift and swallow the entire system with demons of Slanesh. The settlers would then be revealed to be Davenite chaos worshippers, yes they were uh, like they were revealed in this novel. Kiden would then be killed in an ironic way while trying to save them and Galba managed to stop the demon priests and Atticus would manage to stop the emperor's children before it's too late. In this way you get a self-contained story but with more proper antagonists for the Iron Hands to fight you give the main characters different purposes uh, which they managed to accomplish by the end of the novel but, but in the end they all still die. Because in this story you don't have a proper developed antagonist, the scene with the Emperor's children is shoehorned in so hard it breaks the narrative. If it was cut out it wouldn't have made any difference on the overall storyline. The settlers come out of nowhere and considering that the, the loyalists doesn't see them as a threat immediately makes them all just look stupid. There is some stupid infighting within with the Iron Hands and the other legions and they come across as shyless and stubborn. This is not a, a novel I would recommend in the first place. It has some value but it's not much. It's still it's better well written than Nikaim usually is but the overall content is wrongly placed. I will give this novel 3 out of 10 forks and I will not properly recommend it. And with that said, I want to thank you very much for looking at this book review. And don't forget to rate and subscribe to my channel. Please give a thumbs up on my videos. And also leave comments on things I'm doing good so I keep on doing them. And leave negative critique on things I'm doing bad so I need to improve or remove the content entirely. And also don't forget to share it with your friends if it could be interesting, entertaining or simply inspiring. But other than that, thank you very much for watching this book review. For the Emperor! Bye!